sleep, hypnotics and CBTI. How can you help your patients get some rest? This video aims to provide you with evidence-based information to help you make informed decisions. Imagine you see a patient who has poor sleep. What would you do? What factors would you consider? This video is accompanied by an educational handbook. There are two naturally occurring rhythms that govern our sleep-wake cycle. All complex life has a sleep-wake cycle, which takes place over a 24-hour period. This is known as the circadian rhythm, circa meaning about, and dia meaning day. The other rhythm, our ultradian rhythm, governs our level of alertness during the day and the depth of our sleep at night time. Each cycle of the ultradian rhythm lasts roughly 90 minutes. When sleeping, we cycle between REM, rapid eye movement sleep, and stages 1, 2, and 3 of non-REM sleep. N1 sleep is the lightest stage of sleep, which if roused from, sleepers may not realize they were actually asleep. N3 sleep is deep sleep, or slow wave sleep. This is the stage of sleep which tends to create the feeling of being refreshed after a good night's sleep. Cycling between these stages of sleep means there are variations in consciousness levels throughout the night. There are periods of wakening even in the best night's sleep, but these tend not to be remembered. Patients may complain that they always wake around 90 minutes into the night's sleep. This is normal, as it marks the completion of one sleep cycle. At this point, the sleeper switches between REM and non-REM sleep, and waking naturally here is normal. Informing patients that this is part of a normal sleep cycle and nothing to worry about can help to reduce anxiety around sleep. It is important to manage patients' expectations around what normal sleep is. As we age, we naturally require less sleep. Recommended sleep times are averages, and there is natural variation within the population. If a patient sleeps less than the recommended amount, but wakes up feeling refreshed, then this is likely to be normal for them. Time asleep is not the same as time in bed. Spending too much time awake and in bed can exacerbate insomnia. There are many factors which can disturb sleep. These include a sleep disorder, such as restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, insomnia, parasomnias, such as sleepwalking, and circadian rhythm disorders. Another disease state, such as pain, can also disturb sleep, as can stimulating substances such as medication, caffeine, and nicotine. The patient's lifestyle, such as their diet, exercise, and daily routine, as well as the noise, light and temperature of the environment they sleep in, can also affect sleep. Measures should be taken to address sleep disruptors. These quick wins are effective, but can be overlooked when staff are pressured for time and hypnotics reached for instead. Reducing nighttime disturbances, stimulating substances, and daytime napping for insomnia patients can all improve nighttime sleep. Drinking five or more cups of coffee a day, regardless of timing, causes caffeine to reach a steady state in the bloodstream. Reducing the number of cups of coffee consumed per day is just as important as not drinking caffeine later in the day. One can of Coke contains the same amount of caffeine as an espresso. Decaffeinated drinks are not caffeine free. They just contain less caffeine. Sleep can also be improved by introducing a wind down period prior to bed, a routine wake up time every day, exercise and natural light exposure, and ensuring that patients only use the bedroom for sleep, sex, and getting dressed. Hypnotics, sleeping tablets, can be largely split into two categories. Z drugs, such as zopiclone, and benzodiazepines, such as temazepam. Sedating antihistamines, such as promethazine, can be used to promote sleep, but the evidence base for these drugs in insomnia is slim, and the side effect profiles of these drugs are often underestimated. Hypnotics can be used to induce sleep, and where there is an urgent need, their use is important, life-saving, and evidence-based. But as with all drugs, there is a downside to using hypnotics. Long-term hypnotic use can worsen depression, anxiety, and sleep, and can lead to tolerance and dependence in the long run. They increase falls risk, particularly in elderly patients, increase the risk of respiratory depression, and reduce the benefits gained from sleep by delaying the onset of REM sleep, which is important for dreaming, memory, and mood regulation. Hypnotics should be used with caution in patients with respiratory risk factors. When we think about treating a patient struggling with sleep, hypnotics should be considered in parallel to non-pharmacological options. They are a valuable tool, but will only treat symptoms of insomnia, 
rather than addressing the underlying cause. They should be reviewed regularly and their risk and benefit taken into account. Evidence for systematic review shows that cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia is as good as hypnotics in the short term, but has longer lasting benefits in the long term. There is emerging evidence that using hypnotics in conjunction with CBTI can lead to the best outcomes, particularly in challenging patient groups. Cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia, or CBTI, is a relatively simple process. While CBTI is typically delivered in group sessions, there is no reason why practitioners cannot integrate aspects of it into their regular consultations. CBTI sessions will begin with information around sleep education and hygiene. Sleep education helps patients manage expectations of normal sleep, and sleep hygiene consists of simple measures to keep sleep for the night and wakefulness for the day. Stimulus control involves strengthening psychological associations between the bed and sleep, and weakening psychological associations between the bed and wakefulness. In many inpatient settings, patients spend most of their time, whether asleep or awake, in bed. This strengthens their association between the bed and wakefulness. Cognitive therapy involves addressing factors that perpetuate insomnia. These are often maladaptive habits which are different to the original precipitator of insomnia. An example of this is paradoxical intention, where the patient actively tries so hard to get to sleep that they end up making themselves more awake. The best sleep is sleep without any effort. Trying to distract patients from the fact that they can't sleep is important. Techniques for this include finding a relaxing and enjoyable activity that is not stimulating, that patients can do when they can't sleep. For instance, getting out of the bedroom and reading a book or eating a light snack. Instead of dwelling on being unable to sleep, patients are encouraged to think about the benefits of being awake at this time. When they next feel sleepy, they can return to bed. Sleep scheduling involves setting a regular wake-up time and rules for when to go to bed. Instead of setting a regular bedtime, patients should go to bed when they feel tired. Getting into bed at a set time and being unable to sleep will only exacerbate insomnia. Sleep scheduling also includes sleep restriction or compression strategies, which involve limiting the hours between which patients are allowed to sleep, so that when they do sleep, they sleep much more effectively. After the sleep efficiency has improved, sleep can be decompressed or de-restricted to normal times. This is especially useful for getting rid of periods of waking in the night or long sleep latency periods. Lastly, psychoeducation and relaxation strategies can be employed. These include progressive muscle relaxation techniques, where the patient tenses muscle groups from their head to their toes in a progressive nature, and meditation which can be guided by books or apps. In summary, simple lifestyle interventions, in many cases, avoid the need for hypnotic medication. CBTI is evidence-based, recommended by NICE above hypnotics, effective and easy to implement. All practitioners can include aspects of it in their practice. Hypnotics can be extremely useful at managing problems with sleep, but long-term use can lead to negative effects, such as tolerance, dependence, anxiety and depression. The use of hypnotics should be regularly reviewed. What can you do to help your patients sleep well? Thanks for listening.